Esteem brother, Justice Vishwanathan, Sri Adi Shantawala, Chairman of the Supreme Court Bar Association, Mr. Krishnamurti, who is trustee of Shamala Pokhu Memorial Trust, senior members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, Brother Justice Vishwanathan said, this is a subject which is dear to me. And after I saw this small video film on uh, late Shamala Pakku, I thought that uh, this was more appropriate subject. It was kind of legal aid work which she has done during her lifetime for which she received Padmashri. I believe that even this topic would have been very dear to her. The concept of uh, Access to justice as a prime place in our constitution. It is actually inherent part of uh, liberty granted under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Access to justice is a very wide concept. There are different angles to it. Today, of course, uh, when I am here before uh, this August gathering, I will be expressing my personal views. Please do not understand. Please do not confuse between the views of the Supreme Court and my personal views. So today I am expressing strictly my personal views. See, 75 years of existence of uh, constitution and uh, 75 years of independence. I always believe that after India became independent and it became republic in 1950, every citizen of India had very high expectations from the legal system which was given to us by the constitution, the high expectation was that this legal system will provide him easy access to the justice. Access to the justice is not simply filing a, filing a case in court of law or lodging a complaint with the police. When we say access to justice, it has to be a quality and expeditious justice rendered at a reasonable cost. Merely allowing somebody to file a case does not mean that we have granted him access to justice. So 75 years of existence of a constitution, I always believe that we must look back and virtually conduct audit of how the courts have performed to find out whether the courts have really achieved what common man wanted the courts to do or whether we have really fulfilled the uh, expectations of the common man. As a judge of the Bombay High Court and a Chief Justice of Kanaraga High Court even today, I firmly believe that uh, judges should not stay in ivory tower. And as a judge of Bombay High Court, I had number of opportunities to go to taluka places, to visit district places, interact with the lawyers, interact with the litigants coming to the court, then I was set up part of the setup of legal services authority. When in 2018 and 19 we had a three mega legal mega legal services camp in most difficult area, remote areas of Maharashtra. One was in Nakshanai dominated area, where we invited more than 25,000 people uh, to the camps and we ensured that uh, they get several benefits of various schemes of the government. So, and I've been going to so many law colleges, law schools. So, I have been interacting with all stakeholders and my personal view which I can gather from my interaction with all the stakeholders <coughs> is that the judiciary has not fulfilled the expectations of common citizen of India. In fact, we are lagging far behind. Maybe during the last 75 years, you know, in functions like this, <coughs> where bar and bench were together, we kept on patting our own back by saying that, you know, Judiciary is the last resort for common man. Common man has faith in the judiciary. My personal view is that uh, whatever faith was there in uh, maybe 19, 1950, it has eroded considerably due to various reasons. And the main reason, of course, is that we are not able to provide proper access to the justice, a quality justice and a justice at uh, a reasonable cost. And therefore, in my view, we must find out where we have gone wrong. For all these years, we kept on saying that judiciary has done a good job, 
as I said, last resort of common man, etc. Therefore, we never applied our mind to find out where we are going wrong. Now we have, we have to analyze where we have gone wrong. We have to also find out what we should have ideally achieved. I personally believe first reason which I will give you for not fulfilling the expectations of common man. The first reason is that we neglected our trial and district courts which are the primary courts in our system. All along I have been part of uh, legal fraternity for last 40 years, 20 years as a lawyer, 20 years as a judge. Prior to that I was a student of Government Law College. There used to be workshops, seminars, where members of legal fraternity used to attend. I have seen people talking only about High Court and Supreme Court, as if the trial courts do not exist. So we have not given the importance which our uh, trial and district courts deserve. There is one indication why we, uh, one indication which will prove how we neglected these courts. For years together we. We used to describe these courts as lower court, subordinate court, etc., etc. Now there can't be any lower court as such. Every court is a court. There may be a hierarchy for the purposes of uh, purposes of appeal for running the administration, but there is nothing like lower court or subordinate court. In fact, I always believe that the real place where common man gets justice is our trial courts and maybe first appellate courts, district courts. The reason is, the statistics will, will tell you the story, that in so many cases we come across, though a litigant does not succeed before our trial courts or first appellate court, he does not go to higher forum for various reasons. There are social reasons, there are economic reasons, access to justice is one issue. So for a common man who cannot afford to have multiple litigations, perhaps these are the courts which are the final courts. And look at how we have treated these courts. All of you know that there was 5th pay commission, 6th pay commission and 7th pay commission. Of course, pay commission doesn't cover the judiciary. So last 5th, 6th and 7th pay commission, I can share what actually happened. After pay commission was implemented for government servants, the government thought it fit to amend the law and enhance the salary and remuneration payable to the judges of the constitutional courts. But in case of all three pay commissions, there was only one class of public servants which was the last to receive benefit of enhancement of pay. And that was class of our civil and district court judges. <coughs> Even after seventh pay commission, recently, under the orders of the Supreme Court in 2022, a direction was issued to pay enhanced uh, salary at enhanced rate to our judges of the trial court and district courts. All other classes of public servants had received the benefit of pay commission two years earlier, even before onset of COVID. And the government does not do it on its own. On last three occasions, it was the Supreme Court which had to pass a judicial order. Uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday, we must have read, Supreme Court has now passed a judicial order uh, providing for various amenities and perquisites to the judicial officers. So therefore, this is the way we treat our uh, courts, which are real courts. In fact, I always, when I address the judges of the our trial courts, I always tell them, don't carry inferiority complex. You are doing the same job, equally important job, which judges of the constitutional courts are doing. So this is one reason why we are lagging far behind. We are not able to provide proper access to justice, because we have not strengthen our courts at grassroots level. There is one more reason, which, which is one of the core reasons why we are not able to provide effective access to justice. In 2002, our Supreme Court ruled that in India, there should be just to population ratio of 50. So 50 judges per million for 10 lakh population. And direction was to achieve this target within 10 years. So by 2012, the just to population ratio in India ought to have been minimum 50-50. Today, 
we have not crossed 23 today in 2024. And look at the other jurisdictions all over the world, developed countries where they have just to population ratio of 80, 90, in some cases more than 100. Today in 2024, we are struggling at 23. There was one more effort made by the Supreme Court in one of the decisions in the case of Intia Zamar. The Supreme Court laid down a formula for calculating the just strength, how required just strength is to be calculated and direction was issued by the Supreme Court to every High Court. High Court should constitute a committee. Committee should work on uh, the formula and submit a proposal to the state government for increasing the number of posts. I happen to, the chair, I happen to be the chairperson of the concerned committee in Bombay High Court. Going by that formula, we, we found that additional 12,000 posts of judges of various categories will have to be created. So we th thought that though Supreme Court says it, we are too ambitious. So we reworked the whole thing and our proposal was for some 8,000 additional posts. Now this was done I think in 2016 or 17, pursuant to the orders of the Supreme Court. Other day I inquired, I went to Judicial Academy in Maharashtra. I was told that out of 8,000 8, posts demanded, uh, the government has so far sanctioned some 652 posts. So not even 10% of it. And then the other reason is that, where is the infrastructure? In most of the states, the infrastructure of our trial courts is so poor. And uh, in Maharashtra, for example, for three years, Chief Justice constituted a special bench headed by me to deal with infrastructural issues of various courts. So under the orders of my bench, about 11 distinct court buildings were constructed. We issued rid of mandamus, we, and it was like a continuous mandamus. So we ensured that not only construction takes place, but actually the utilization starts. And this is so in several states. Karnataka is one exception where government gives the best possible facility to the court. But Karnataka is an exception. So, I, I always give one very interesting example. Uh, I am told that, that is so in various states. In Maharashtra, in all district places, you know, there is a designated place where all uh, top government officers and judges have their residential quarters. The district collector, the commissioner of police or the uh, superintendent of police, the superintendent engineer of PWD, everybody is together in one locality. So whenever I used to go and visit many district places in Maharashtra, maybe administrative judge, guardian judge, or for official work, I used to always go for a walk in that area. And I have said so in my public speech in Bombay and in Karnataka also, that if you don't see the nameplates on the houses, it is very easy to identify the occupant of the house. I always notice in Maharashtra, the best maintained house is of the executive engineer or superintendent engineer of PWD. <laughs> and second category is of collector, commissioner of police, etc. And the worst house, houses, you can say that for sure that they are houses of judicial officers, where tarpaulin is, tarpaulin is used to cover uh, the house from leakages, etc. So this is the state of affairs. We always kept on thinking about our uh, constitutional courts and did not uh, pay any heed to the requirements of our grassroots level courts, which are the courts of common man. We, to some extent, even the legislature has contributed for clogging of our trial and uh, district courts or session score. All of us know section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act. A pure civil wrong is converted into an offense. And look at the scenario. Go to any metropolitan city in India, across India, where either there are courts of metropolitan magistrates or judicial magistrates, you will find that every magistrate has more than 100 matters on every day on the cause list and maybe 25-30% are 138 matters. That is how the legislature has clogged the uh, system. There is one more reason why our system gets clogged. One reason, of course, I told you, lack of infrastructure, lack of, lack of man manpower, and uh, these are the kinds of cases uh, with which the judges are flooded. One more area where we must work very hard. There is a remarkable change in our society during the last 20 years, as a result of which you see large number of 
Matrimonial disputes being filed in the court. Go to any metropolitan city like Bombay, Bangalore, I can speak for these two cities. If family court is flooded with divorce petitions and restoration of conjugal petitions, and now what we see is if there is one matrimonial dispute, there is one, one or two matrimonial petitions, there is one complaint under section 498A, one proceeding under section 125, one proceeding under section 12 of DV Act, and unfortunately if there are children born from the marriage, then uh, custody proceedings. So one matrimonial litigation is creating five litigations at grassroots level, and just count in numbers. Then there will be revision applications, appeals, 482 petitions, 227 petitions. So how much of litigation we are creating? You can see that from Supreme Court, those are practicing in Supreme Court. How many transfer petitions we get? And all transfer petitions, barring few exceptions, are in matrimonial matters. And every case we see there are multiple uh, litigations. Now, these disputes are going to virtually overtake our trial and uh, district courts or our family courts. And therefore, there are people who are genuine litigants, they have to wait in the queue for a long time. So, even the social changes are contributing to uh, clogging of our trial courts. And there is one more area uh, where again there can be a debate. Now, uh, what legislature has done? to reduce the filing of cases arising out of matrimonial dispute. Now some of you know there is a Commercial Courts Act where uh, before filing, conciliation is mandatory. It's a pre-filing conciliation. The legislature could have come out with such some such measure before uh, the litigating parties, the husband and wife go to the court, they could have some effort to conciliate. In fact, <coughs> making a little departure in Bombay I could be started an experiment. Uh, when I was chairperson of the Legal Services Authority. We set up a center known as Let's Talk. We invited uh, all leading universities like Bombay University, TISS in Mumbai, uh, SNDT University to deputy their heads of the Department of Psychology. And through them we procured services of expert counselors. And the scheme is, we told the police, we called police, they are social security branches. The moment a wife or husband comes to you for filing complaint, please refer them to this center, Let's Stop. So that even before legal proceedings are taken, our counselors will try to either <coughs> patch up the dispute or maybe uh, convince the parties to have a golden handshake in the sense that apply for, apply for dissolution of marriage by consent. For one year it worked. It is working in Aurangabad and some smaller places. But such experiments have to be done on larger scale and such experiments must be backed by provisions of law. So legislature will have to step in and will have to ensure that before parties start dedicating in matrimonial dispute that this kind of an avenue is available where parties can bring about settlement. There is one more aspect of the matter. I always believe that our courts and legal system exist for common man. But look, look what we have done. Now we have commercial courts act, a separate setup for commercial uh, commercial disputes, separate procedure, and uh, we received communications from government of India to establish dedicated commercial courts. And Bangalore was the first city where we have dedicated commercial courts, very modern courts with all the amenities. The question which asked, I asked myself, I may be wrong there. This commercial litigation does not constitute even 5% of the total litigation in India. So why are we giving priority to these commercial cases when cases of common man are not reaching in the court? So this question we have to ask to ourselves and to the legislature also that in country like India, where for smallest thing person has to go to the court, what is the propriety of creating a special class of commercial cases and uh, providing that cases should be given priority. So now we have just see the provisions of Commercial Courts Act. Now almost all our senior civil judges, now they keep on giving priority to the commercial cases because there is a time bound schedule under the Act. Now 
There are reasons and reasons. One example I'll give and I'll go to the next topic. There's a prohibition law in Bihar. So, prohibition law resulted into filing huge number of bail petitions. So, percentage, percent, speaking percentage wise, the filing increased by 30 to 40 percent. And therefore, we had a scenario where more than half of the judges in Bihar, they take up uh, bail matters or maybe questioning matters. So, these are the legislations also which uh, bring about a situation where common man is deprived of access to justice. Now, there is one more area where we are lagging behind. We are not able to have a consistent policy about our priorities. You know, there are various categories of cases filed in the court. To give an example of a civil court, there is a simple money suit, there is a suit for partition, there is a matrimonial dispute, there is dispute over inventory rights, there is dispute over specific performance of the contract, so many cases. Now, we don't have a policy which decides which cases should be given priority. I remember a few years back, Supreme Court said, give priority to cases of all senior citizens. <coughs> it is beside the point, but I, I always feel that how age of 60 years can be age of a senior citizen? <laughs> the passage of time. Increase only. Oh, that's it, that's it. Now, very funny directions were issued by all high courts. Every court should give priority to the cases of senior citizens. So in Bombay High Court, I used to get applications when I used to preside over second appeal bench that my, my, I have filed appeal six months back, I am senior citizen, this is the order of the Supreme Court, give priority. I used to ask one question to everybody. In every high court, there is a huge pendency of second appeals under section 100. And in most of the high courts, the pendency is for 20 years, 25 years or even more. So in all these second appeals, because by the time uh, matter reaches the stage of second appeal, already 10-15 years are consumed. So in all second appeals, without exception, you will find that the litigants are second or third generation litigants. So today, a question is, are you going to give priority to cases of third generation of litigants? They, have, they inherit the litigation along with the property. Or are you going to say that, oh no, somebody is 60 years old, give him priority. In fact, this issue used to arise every day when I used to preside over family court appeal bench. There are many applications used to, Bombay is a very funny city, you know. There are cases where the uh, couples who are more than 60 years, they go to family court, start a new fight at the age of 60 also. <laughs> so I used to receive applications, say, sir, I am senior citizen, give priority to my family court appeal. So I have to always tell them that, look, you are senior citizen, if priority is to be given, I will give priority to a family court appeal where parties are in early 30s. Because if I resolve the dispute, they will be able to start leading a new life. The example which I am giving you is to just to indicate to you that we do not have a policy about our priorities. Maybe we judges feel that, you know, how can we discuss policy? How can we encroach upon each other's uh, jurisdiction, judicial uh, uh, jurisdiction? Therefore, we don't discuss that. If you want to improve the access to justice, someday we have to come out with a rational policy of giving priorities. And then that usual thing happens. Somebody goes to Supreme Court, somebody goes to High Court. When we pass orders, decide a case within seven days, decide a case within 15 days, 20 days. This happens routinely. So somebody who can afford to engage a good counsel in uh, higher court, gets priority and all other people, those who can't afford, they patiently wait in the queue. This happens because we don't have that sense of uh, priorities. What are our priorities as judges? Maybe priorities will differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Maybe some family court, for example. <coughs> family court will have di di different category of litigations. The policy of priority will be different in family court. Which cases are to be given priority? <coughs> There is one more area of concern. Now, there is a priority given to criminal appeals of uh, those who are languishing in jail, appeals against conviction. So, we give them priority because they are not on bail. While we do that, we say that those who are on bail, maybe in 302 case, there is no urgency in the appeal. Practically, all leading high courts will find that 
there is pendency of 15 years or 20 years of appeals against conviction where accused are on bail. And look at the disastrous consequence. If you don't hear such matters by giving priority, after a gap of 20 years when the High Court confirms the sentence, say a life sentence, after a gap of 20 years, the person has to go to jail and undergo punishment. Now, 20 years is a huge span. People move ahead in life. And suddenly, the case reaches and if a clear open and shut case is there, we are bound to say that yes, 302 is proved and therefore he has to undergo life imprisonment. So there also we have to think about our priorities. <coughs> Perhaps we have to balance both the categories of appeals. Now, one solution for improving access to justice was found by legislature by legislating Legal Services Authorities Act 1987. In fact, the concept of legal service uh, under the Act is completely different. It is not merely about you know giving uh, assisting parties to file a case or in a court of law or to defend a case in court of law. It is something more the legal services. <coughs> I'll make little departure from this. I refer to the camps, mega uh, legal uh, services camp which we had. Now we thought that, what is legal service? There are schemes of the government. I'll tell you one is Sanjay Gandhi Nirana Yojana. There is a scheme of the government where if you are below poverty line, you will guess, uh, get a cooking gas cylinder and some other equipment in kitchen. Some farmers get some equipment, <laughs> agricultural implement, uh, implements. So we realized that though these schemes are there, the common man, the poor person, he does not know that schemes are available. So our what we did was, we ensured that all these people who are entitled to this benefit of scheme, they applied for benefit of the scheme. And we ensured that one month before the uh, camp was held, actually these applications are cleared. And when all these people, about 30,000 people appeared, uh, notionally we distributed the certificates, making them entire to that scheme. In fact, startling experience I have, kind of, world in which we live. We had set up a counter for Aadhaar card and PAN card. Half of the persons, we had one camp in Naksharai dominated area near Nagpur. Half of the persons were not aware what is Aadhaar card. Forget about PAN card. Though by that time there was a rule that your account will become inoperational if you don't have Aadhaar card. So, this is a wider concept of uh, justice or legal services. And this wider concept is incorporated in the Legal Services Authority Act. Now, who gets legal aid under the Legal Services Authority Act? Section 12 provides for various categories. One category is that uh, one who belongs to scheduled caste or scheduled tribe, a woman, a child, then uh, victims of a mass disaster, ethnic violence, caste atrocities, etc. <coughs> they are all entitled to free legal aid. There are several categories. Now, one category is very interesting. Now, today, one reason why a person cannot afford to approach the court of law is poverty. Now, we need to amend this section. There is a clause in uh, section 12 which says that in case of uh, a poor person or belong to weaker section, economically weaker section of society, under clause H of section 12, he will get free legal aid for filing proceedings in all courts except Supreme Court, provided his yearly income is less than 9,000 rupees. So his monthly income is less than 1,000. In Supreme Court, his ability is 12,000. This requires amendment. Now today, the rate of minimum wages has gone up. But here we are lagging behind. In fact, very interesting move was made. I am not able to get information by the Supreme Court. <coughs> Brother Jassi Vishwanathan may be aware of that. The Supreme Court felt that those who belong to middle class of the society, they are not able to afford lawyers. And therefore, a society was registered yeah, in the Society Registration Act. Society, Supreme Court middle income group. Correct. Right. Correct. Now, I don't know how far uh, it is functioning effectively. It is uh, functioning. I was secretary and treasurer. Correct. Uh, it, it is one of the very good schemes because That's many right. get out of this income bracket. <coughs> And they are unable to offer the fees. So today, nobody so, can get covered by this. So for, uh, for 15,000 plus 15, right. they are able to get service throughout. 
a number of people are availing it. Only the problem is, unlike the Supreme Court legal aid, middle income has no grant. That's it. So they go by uh, you know the money which the litigant gives or costs ordered right. by the court. At that time, we what we felt was we for high court we constituted a panel of lawyers which to ask them to appear pro bono. So I now in new role, the suitors fund whenever there is no claim, right? Send it, but I disclosed to them that I was one suitor. So therefore. Uh, whether legal service authorities act has really made access, access to justice more easy. And as Brother Vishwanathan has said, this is one class of the society, middle class, somebody, you know, uh, somebody is a small time worker, somebody is a small time trader, somebody is a primary teacher. If they are required to go to the uh, court, how they can afford to engage a lawyer? And it's not engaging lawyer in one court, we have hierarchy of appeals, revisions, etc. Before I Close this topic, only one illustration I'll give you. In 2012, I was sitting in the Aurangabad bench of Bombay High Court, heading a writ bench. So we used to receive so many uh, uh, petitions for writ of pandemus. In Maharashtra, the scheme of the government that certain schools are fully funded by the state. So salary of the teachers uh, and all other expenditure comes from the government. But there's a rule which says that even in such school a teacher is to be appointed, he cannot be appointed without the approval of the education officer of the Jilla Parishad. And uh, we were flooded with petitions that asked the education officer, issued it of Mandana was directing him to grant permission. So I was, I thought it why we should be flooded with such matters. My colleague was a very distinguished judge who was born and brought up in that Marathwada area. He said, sir, this is a very genuine difficulty. Because if the teacher Teacher starts teaching because there is no approval, he doesn't get salary. And somehow now impression is that instead of going repeatedly to visit the office of the uh, education officer, it is cheaper to engage a lawyer and get a writ of pandemus from the court. So for these small things also people have to approach the uh, high court. And that is where this uh, legal aid for the middle income uh, age group uh, becomes very relevant. I know that we are running out of time and I want to close by saying something different. I have just highlighted areas where we have gone wrong. This is only by of illustration. It requires great deal of research, collection of data to find out exactly where we have gone wrong and exactly why we are not able to fulfill the aspirations of common man. There are a lot of expectations from the entire setup of judiciary. When I talk about judiciary, it also includes the lawyers. So. There were expectations, those expectations remain, but somehow there are many who feel that we are let common man down. There is one more very important issue which even exists today after 75 years of independence. We talk about helping somebody to go to the court and we talk about what is known as docket explosion. So there is a docket explosion all over courts in India, but even today Please talk to those who work at grassroots level of the district legal service authority or taluka legal service authority. Even as of today, by reason of maybe social reasons, maybe economic reason, maybe any reason, today there is a large class of citizens who even do not think of approaching the court of justice for getting justice. And they keep on suffering the injustice silently. So docket explosion is one challenge to the access to justice. But this is also a challenge where only legal service and authority or some social organization can do some work and ensure that people do not silently suffer injustice. So this is just a broad uh, view of the present status of access to justice in our courts. The idea of saying all this is to, you know, to start a thinking process. I have been saying this in all conferences of the legal service and authorities. Whenever I address the judicial officer and judicial academies, I mean making them aware of where we are going wrong. So I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to interact with all of you. And I am glad that now, on one of the working day, this small hall is full, the complete audience here. So I again thank the uh, organizers and uh, I hope and trust that uh, Shamla <coughs> Memorial Trust continues these activities. Only one suggestion which I want to make. Uh, next time when you have such a lecture, uh, please get in touch with 
all the law clerks associated with the judges of the High Court at Delhi Supreme Court, and there are interns. But this will be on the YouTube also. We will, right. we will circulate the. The so YouTube, yes, it's an excellent idea. But you know, for younger members of the bar, interns and uh, law clerks, uh, to remain present physically is a different thing for them. So again, I thank all the members of the audience. Thank you.